My name's Alex Orgy and I'm the Classic Subject Advisor at OCR. Um, I'm planning to just give you a bit of a, an overview as to sort of like what the, the picture of Classic's take up is uh, nationally uh, before moving on to looking at um, I guess some of the frequently asked questions about particularly the A-level classical civilization uh, but I can also touch upon uh, the GCSE classical civilization or any of the other Classic's qualifications that OCR offers. So this is the national picture of what's happening in terms of the A-level take-up. And as I guess you can see, the, there's been a, a massive drop-off, particularly in the take-up of A-level classical civilization. And this really coincides uh, with the government reform uh, to uh, move from uh, unitized qualifications to linear qualifications um, and centers, therefore, really offering students the choice of three A-levels rather than four AS levels with the option to, I guess, drop one at the end of... Uh, the, the lower sixth. Hopefully, um, in the next couple of years, that uh, the numbers will uh, uh, plateau and then start to rise uh, as part of some of the initiatives that particularly the, the Warwick group have done here, but also other stakeholder groups. When it comes to the AS level, the drop-off is even more dramatic. Um, for example, this year, I think we had 24 candidates taking the AS level classical Greek and... Um, I think it was just about 300, or just over 300, taking the AS level in classical civilization. The OCR are committed to continue offering AS level qualifications uh, for the lifetime of these specifications, but I guess when it comes to the next round of reform, uh, we will have to review exactly what um, uh, we do in, in that place. Uh, I know certainly other exam boards, uh, when developing uh, some of their qualifications, have only developed an A level qualification, and that might be something that we uh, do uh, in this field. I don't know whether it would be interesting just to see uh, the popularity of the various different options within the new specification. Um, the, the data from the World of a Hero is uh, from live marking. Um, so I took the data probably a week or so ago. Um, and due to the random nature of the allocations, I would have thought that that would remain fairly constant um, once we've got all of the, the results in. And I guess when it comes to um, the culture and the arts component group, that there's no real surprise that the Greek theatre uh, is the most popular. I guess we are slightly surprised to see um, how few candidates are sitting the Greek art option, and I guess that that's particularly uh, when it's up against Greek theatre um, that would explain why that's um, so low. Previous specifications that there was quite a large uh, number of candidates taking that. And then I guess we're really pleased to see that um, in the third component group, which is completely new in terms of the OCR specifications, that there's a uh, a fairly even take-up of the components there. For anyone teaching A-level ancient history, there's the, the figures. And uh, in terms of this PowerPoint, certainly I can uh, ask Paul to, to circulate it around. And then this is the trends that are uh, occurring in GCSE. That by and large, things are fairly stable. I guess with the classical civilization, there has been a slight fall over, I guess, the last decade. In terms of uh, the GCSE Latin, uh, that sudden peak in 2018 was the, uh, a number of centres taking GCSE who would have previously been taking the Level 1-2 certificate that WJC offer. But, uh, we have seen a, a slight rise in the number of uh, candidates taking our GCSE in Latin, uh, 1 or 2 percent. And from chatting to teachers delivering the EDUCAS GCSE, I believe there's also seen a rise. So there's at least some... Uh, positive signs in terms of the take up there. And then in terms of uh, the GCSE, classical civilization, and the popularity of the, the different courses, uh, it comes as no surprise to us um, that the myth and religion option is by far the most popular. And when it comes to the second component group, uh, we're pleased to see that um, a number of students have been taking the, the war and warfare option, which I guess was... Um, a fairly significant change from anything that OCR had previously offered. But with the removal of AQA from uh, the classical civilization marketplace, the OCR now have a, a near monopoly on all of the classics qualifications. Um, and that means that we have an enormous data set on uh, all of the schools uh, taking classics qualifications. Um, we are very happy to share information uh, with you if you are wanting to find uh, 
a particular school nearby uh, teaching the same option as you. Um, it is a, a, a simple search in one of the spreadsheets that we have. Um, likewise, if you want to form sort of wider support groups, uh, we are very happy to help sort of like share some information that will make your lives much easier in collating that. And likewise, we can just zoom in much more and see exactly where uh, centres are taking these qualifications to help uh, make sure that we target um, the right areas in terms of when we offer uh, or where we offer our uh, CPD. And then moving on to certain specific points, I think it's really important to note that when it comes to the assessment of our qualifications, that we are assessing the specification um, and not the textbook. That the textbooks are there to help support you delivering the qualification, but all of our questions are designed to assess the content as listed uh, within the specification. Within the textbooks themselves, uh, there are also sort of like caveats as to what we endorse and what we don't endorse. Um, so um, the parts of the textbook that refer to assessment materials are ones that um, have not been endorsed by OCR formally. That we have tried to make sure wherever possible uh, that the questions that appear within the textbook are aligned as best as possible uh, to the types of questions that we all ask in the live exam. But just please be aware of that caveat. And then sort of touching upon, um, I guess, areas that have been flagged up with this most recent summer series. Um, one of them, uh, with the A-level classical civilization, has been in relation to the World of the Hero paper and the comparative 10 mark question. That uh, I think this, uh, I guess, concern uh, was first raised when we uh, released our practice papers in January, um, where previously our specimen paper and the materials uh, within the textbook had very much focused on, I guess, literary style in terms of the questions, whereas the practice paper and the question that we asked in the live exam um, did not necessarily follow uh, that exact pattern. In terms of what we are looking for in the exam, uh, the same type of thing is expected. So we are looking for candidates to draw out information from both the Homeric passage that they have studied and uh, the passage from Virgil um, and use that uh, to answer the question that we have posed. Um, in terms of sort of preparing your students for this type of question, that um, the questions that or the passages that appear within uh, the question paper have to be equally applicable uh, to those students taking um, uh, the Iliad as well as the Odyssey. Um, so that's sort of like narrowing down um, potentially what we can ask straight away. Uh, so in terms of preparing, I would recommend looking through um, all of the content for um, the World of a Hero question paper or in, in the specification and highlighting areas uh, that are common to all three epics. And that will certainly give you a, a clear idea as to uh, the potential areas that we can ask those questions on. And then sort of going forward, thinking about which passages from the epics um, could be um, very uh, good in uh, terms of offering uh, comparison. I guess potentially uh, the thing that has caused uh, certainly the most amount of column inches is in terms of um, whether we're allowed to ask dates in the exam. Um, that we feel that this is something that is on the specification, um, that there is a area within the knowledge, skills and understanding expected for um, certainly the visual material culture, um, which is uh, the ways in which the social, political, religious and cultural context of the production impacts on the creation of the visual material culture. Also, uh, within the specification, um, where we provide a detailed um, reference to the visual material sources, we do have the dates uh, of uh, the production or when we think that they were produced. I think it's also worth drawing your attention to uh, the question that we asked in the imperial image uh, question. Note that it doesn't actually ask you to say the date. That in the standardisation meeting, uh, I think we are accepting um, answers like after the death of Augustus. So the concerns that people were raised were taken to the standardization meeting to discuss, to um, determine what answers 
uh, we would accept and to help influence um, what we would uh, give marks to and what potentially we wouldn't give marks to. I guess perhaps the one big thing that was causing concern prior to the first assessment um, was how the scholarship would be marked uh, in the 30 mark questions. Um, certainly uh, the level 2 um, AO2 descriptor made reference to little or no um, secondary sources scholarship um, or academic works. So um, we had a meeting uh, of all of the lead markers for the nine components within the A-level specification uh, prior to uh, any of the marking taking place this summer. The, in that meeting, uh, we thrashed out uh, the general approach that we would take when marking the 30 mark essays. Uh, and it was felt that um, we would use the, the first bullet point within um, the AO2 to determine the level uh, which uh, an essay would get. And then we would use the second bullet point to help nuance where within that level um, the response uh, would get the mark. So that does mean if there was an exceptionally good essay that does not mention any scholarship, that it can still get a, a level five answer. I think so. There are a lot of things essentially going on um, within uh, the AO2 uh, descriptor, um, and that's just highlighting it uh, within the first bullet point. Um, so there is a, a lot of things to take into consideration uh, when it comes to um, determining the mark. And this really comes back down to the approach uh, that we want to take with uh, using the levels of response squids, highlighting the best fit approach. That um, Certainly this first year, um, I think we wanted to perhaps be generous uh, in terms of the application of the marking grids. Um, but we felt that it was most fair to candidates uh, in the approach that we have agreed uh, at, the, uh, at the meeting before the standardisation uh, meetings took place for the individual components. I think one thing that uh, has come across um, from some of the marking that uh, I think we are going to take on board is that um, in the world of the hero, uh, there are three essay questions and candidates have to answer one of those. Um, certainly talking to the lead marker, the, there have been a number of students who have seen uh, question eight, uh, even though they've studied the Odyssey, and that question is on the Iliad, and they have started answering that question. So we are going to explore ways uh, to make it explicitly clear um, that the particular question eight, question nine, and question ten, which epics they are targeted on. That we felt that when we wrote the question paper that that was obvious enough, um, but it seems that students in the heat of the exam have missed sort of like the second sentence within the questions where it clearly identifies which epic that we are assessing. In the circumstance of um, students doing that, our examiners will look as closely as possible to see ways that we can potentially award marks, um, but if there isn't anything worthy of credit, unfortunately, uh, the students uh, will receive zero marks for that question. I guess that's some of the, the key points that I have certainly flagged up uh, in terms of the A-level classical civilization. So I'm very happy to take any questions now about certain parts of the course. I think it really comes down to these questions are marked using a levels of response grid. Um, so, um, or virtually all of them, so that the 10, uh, the 20, and the 30 mark questions. And I don't think there's anywhere in the grids where we're sort of looking for specific technical terms uh, in order to be sort of like a tick box exercise uh, to be able to get sort of like very detailed knowledge. I think if they know them, demonstrate them. But it's not something that is sort of like a, a hidden box that they need to jump through in order to get a certain level. I think, yeah, it doesn't matter necessarily. Um, I know it was against the spirit of the writing of the exam, but do I understand that if they don't actually use any scholarship reference, they can still get top marks? They can certainly get uh, a mark from the top level for AO2. 
um, certainly um, based on what we're doing this summer. I think that um, if people start to game the system and there is no uh, reference to scholars in the vast majority uh, of essays, I think we would perhaps have to review our approach uh, to using the marking grids. Um, but I think that the only advice that we can say is it clearly states within the specification that you do need to uh, make reference uh, to uh, scholars, uh, academic work, secondary sources, uh, in order to sort of like enhance your uh, analysis and evaluation. Uh, and uh, that's all that we... Um, would say. Um, in the, the degree of reference, you might quote an author as saying, if you don't quote page, number, book... Oh, we, do, we don't need that at all. That, um, to allocate the right author to the argument you pitch. I think if they can remember the name, fantastic. Uh, we don't need anything necessarily more than that. Um, we can use sort of like um, schools of thought, so feminist interpretations, uh, for example. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be scholars. So if you've been to a performance of Aristophanes' Frogs um, and the director has taken a slightly different interpretation, uh, you can use that as, a, I guess, a, a secondary source uh, to bring into your essay. Um, the, in the advice that we've been giving out uh, to people at our CPD sessions is saying that essentially they've got a lot of things to do in that 30 mark question. They've got 45 minutes to answer the question. That they've got to use the classical sources. Um, they've got to create an argument. So uh, a couple of references uh, to sort of what we're terming wider scholarship, um, potentially from two different people, um, would be uh, sufficient. I think it comes back to sort of like the marking grids um, that we are interpreting the, the second bullet point in a holistic way. Uh, and if that's um, mirrored with perhaps uh, more basic uh, analysis and evaluation of the classical sources, I think that helps form a judgment as to where that particular response is. That I don't think examiners are looking at individual particular points and saying that's a level one part. It's uh, coming to an overall judgment as to uh, what they would award um, for that whole assessment objective, taking on board also the first bullet point. I think in the example that you gave, I think you can quite clearly see that that's someone um, just trying to uh, clutch at straws. I think uh, in terms of uh, what's being said, I think there's a, 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 a common number of uh, academics that are being quoted. Um, and I think that if examiners do come across something that they find a little bit unusual or they haven't heard of a scholar, they'll have a quick Google to see if they can um, locate um, that person. That We have seen examples in the standardisation meetings of... Um, candidates uh, quoting their teacher. Um, that, <laughs> that is yeah. not something that we're especially looking for. Yeah. I, I know that there's no scholarship reading for the 20 mark question, but have you applied the same approach to the first bullet point dictating the level and then the second dictating where in the level? Um, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, I think it's uh, less of an issue in terms of sort of... Um, the scholarship uh, bit that I think that certainly in, I guess, preparing for this course, there has been enormous focus on that scholarship thing. Um, and it was something that we really wanted to thrash out uh, to make sure that we had a consistent approach um, across all of the, the nine different components. Um, not particularly, no. I think if they... I think it depends as to what they're quoting. If I think there are sort of like boxes where there are scholarship, that is absolutely fine. I, I think that the textbook courses themselves wouldn't necessarily uh, view themselves. Um, One of them definitely wasn't <laughs> Well, <sorry. laughs> 
And I think it just comes down to that they might have used perhaps the textbook author, but they might have used um, some academic elsewhere that perhaps uh, been mentioned uh, explicitly within a textbook. Um, and it sort of comes back to this sort of best fit approach that we're not going to suddenly think they have quoted the textbook author. We are absolutely going to hammer them. It's rewarding them for what they have achieved rather than sort of looking for reasons to take off points. Can they quote a video game? Have a student do that in a mock as a secondary source. You can quote the reason of course. Then I assume that would apply to a video game as well. The game of Civilization Five. Right. Um, I don't think that's necessarily really what we're looking for when it came to um, this part of the specification. Sorry, can I just say again on the thing on best way, they definitely said that, and they also mentioned the Assassin's Creed, which is not Right. <laughs> I think it potentially comes back to how historical they are. Um, I think Assassin's Creed has perhaps had um, more historical input than perhaps other games. I don't know. But um. Are you disrupted then to say exactly what they are then, like what you said, the good science and generate that, that might be a good notion of the academic but a work that was disrupted then from curators and scholars as well? So in terms of the assessment grids, they will stay um, the same for the lifetime of the specification unless we ask Ofqual uh, to change them. Um, in terms of how they're interpreted, uh, I cannot see that we would want to differ how we interpret it next year, uh, given that um, we haven't had a chance to say, look, uh, and see potentially the impact that um, the decision that we've made in terms of how we're assessing it this year has followed through. Um, it might be that in subsequent years that we see that um, this is sort of being gained to an extent and that we then might want to uh, change our approach to uh, reduce uh, the chance of uh, that happening. Sorry, I've got the paper with me, but at the, at the top where you mention the candidates for each of these assessment scholars, it also included references to how the ancient ordinance and modern ordinance might be used in the future. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just wondered about, because you've explained how the secondary scholarship uh, is, is kind of being assessed and looked for. Yes, so um, you should also consider possible interpretations of sources by different audiences. I think there was a, a much lesser extent. I, I think certain questions, um, so I think one of the questions in the Greek theatre uh, explicitly steered students into looking that, at that type of thing. Um, I guess you could argue that uh, sort of like looking at different interpretations uh, from academics to perhaps the student's own personal uh, response is being able to, to demonstrate that. Uh, there was a yeah, there was a, a far less emphasis um, on that um, in terms of the application of the marking grids than uh, the scholarship. But it will be there next year. So that statement in top on the top yeah. of um, I guess all of the essay questions will remain constant um, for the lifetime of um, the specification unless we formally announce uh, through uh, an update uh, that we're going to change that. I think we've certainly seen some uh, students uh, attempting uh, the question papers, potentially starting with the 30-mark question, then working back to the 20-mark question, and then the 10-mark question. Um, that's not something that's necessarily desirable, I guess. The 10-mark the, the questions do lead into the 20-mark question. Um, Um, I haven't seen that many scripts. I've just been in uh, sort of like the first day of some of the standardisation meetings and uh, the lead markers and people who have been examining will have a, a far better idea of that. Um, I think we haven't necessarily seen that um, so far, and also in from the comments I've received. Um, I think that students are writing far less than potentially they would have done on certainly the OCR legacy specification uh, due to, the, I guess, the more uh, bitty nature of the questions that we have. Um, but I think certainly that um, the 10 mark questions do lead into uh, the 20 mark questions. So even if students are going to be starting with the, the 30 mark essay question, uh, then do go back onto uh, the 10 mark questions rather than then uh, starting with the 20 mark question after the 30 mark question. Right. Just on the 
Not of course, no. Yeah, uh, we, we mark um, each individual answer on the basis of its own merits. Um, the, it's sort of, um, in terms of the, the structure, um, the 10 marks, obviously, that you can use those to help mine information for the 20 mark questions. So it would seem sensible to start with, the, uh, if you are going to start with the essay question, then to move on to them rather than the 20 mark question. Um, it's certainly not on the radar. Uh, the, I have given out sort of like feedback forms, and if it's something that you really feel strongly about, please put that on there so I can use that as sort of like a, as an evidence base uh, to take to our <laughs> to our product support team. Um, I think that uh, in terms of um, materials that are out there, there's the omnibus articles which are completely free of charge that have been specifically written uh, for uh, A-level students, uh, so they are accessible. Um, there are, I guess, YouTube videos. I think the Yale University have some that might be applicable. Um, and in terms of sort of like reading stuff themselves, there's nothing to say that students actually have to read articles themselves. That it could be the, the teacher uh, having read something which is perhaps a, a way too high a level uh, for the students and just simplifying it in, uh, I guess, a, a short quote or uh, paraphrase and giving that uh, to the students. And sort of like sessions that, uh, t like today, uh, they can use sort of. Uh, Examples that have been uh, mentioned there. Uh, certainly, I know that uh, Sovereign Education have run things. Uh, I know other university outreach programs certainly have days geared towards students coming along. And uh, certainly, we have seen a number of students saying, uh, Peter Jones has said, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that's an equally valid way of approaching the scholarship. Um, in terms of sort of like videos that I have had. Uh, a meeting with uh, Masalit recently, and I think they're certainly aware that um, they're quite expensive uh, and what they can do to try and sort of widen uh, their reach. Um, so there might be things in the, the pipeline there to try and make this a little bit more accessible. Because, I mean, it's really, I mean, it's in terms of preparing for university, presumably what lies behind it, us giving patients a front and positive vision is actually not very good. Yeah, and... And I think certainly um, when it comes to the next round of reform, we can uh, review potentially how we uh, implement this requirement uh, that uh, A-level ancient history has a similar requirement to study um, modern interpretations. And in the assessment, we have a, an unseen interpretation uh, from a, a modern scholar. Uh, we don't specify any particular scholars. And it's just a simply a case of them reading through the passage, uh, understanding and breaking down the argument that's being put forward um, and find answering a question as to how convincing they find that, and that's certainly something we can explore uh, next time around, uh, whether we could do that. <laughs> yeah, so it would be instead of this, and it might be on a much uh, narrower area. So potentially uh, one thought would be that uh, given that the Virgil is the only compulsory part of the whole specification, it could be uh, only there.
I mean, I mean, there's huge words out there, but that's not the issue. The issue is that we're trying to get people to understand what actually happened in the US, which we always want to hear, which is not easy, and then, you know, reading, you know, whatever it is in front of us in depth, which is which the, 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 what, what the English course does is it narrows it down so that you have 10 things that you know will be useful to you, and then you can add in as you go along, but I think that's probably um, a concern that people have raised on uh, both uh, thematic papers. And I think certainly um, when it comes to the next round of reform, we can certainly look at what we can do there to uh, make it more manageable. Um, yeah, um, I, I don't think I can sort of like officially answer that. I think it's entirely up to you as to what you do, providing you think that you're covering the content as listed in the specification. Yeah, so um, yeah, we have a service called Active Results, um, which allows you to analyze um, each individual student's uh, performance uh, against the national average. Um, and hopefully you can use that to, I guess, see trends and patterns uh, within your cohort's performance. Uh, but we are having some new style exam reports. So uh, for this year, there are going to be sort of small extracts from uh, candidate responses that will go into the examiner's reports to help exemplify um, some of the points that the, the, uh, the lead marker is making. Leading on from that, we are going to be having some uh, candidate exemplar resources produced. Um, so there will be uh, exemplars for um, all of the different components, um, mainly focusing in on the questions marked using a levels of response grid. Um, those materials um, will be used at our exam feedback uh, CPD. So. Um, Within, I guess, the next month, uh, we should be uh, loading dates um, onto the OCR website uh, to be able to book on to the courses. But I certainly know that our A-level Latin and Classical Greek exam feedback session has already gone live. Um, so we'll be having that. Um, so I guess in terms of the exemplar resources, once we've had our face-to-face -face, uh, CPD, uh, which is going to be in the first term, um, the resources uh, themselves will be released after that. Um, so, yeah, I, I think we're trying to alert stu uh, people to them uh, using sort of the e-alert e um, that we've been using to highlight uh, various different um, resources or updates. Um, just a, a point on the earliness of the exams. Um, I've noticed next year they're just as early. Is yeah. there any kind of hope that they might be compiled with the other subjects? Because mine was still way earlier. So I think um, the A-level uh, World of the Hero exam was the first A-level exam, um, but there were exams the following week uh, for other A-level subjects. Um, that um, w I, I guess it really comes down to the Joint Council for Qualifications who uh, liaise with all of the exam boards to come up with a timetable. Um, that we have specifically asked for the AS and the A-level exams to be on the same day so that we can... Um, potentially use the same questions in the exams so that we don't have to um, potentially add in extra sources midway through the specification in order to avoid uh, predictable assessment. Um, we do potentially have an option to say to the Joint Council for Qualifications, we would like to move that exam back a week. 
uh, but that would then mean uh, you'll be doing, or students will be doing two A-level exams for classical civilization uh, within the same week. Uh, certainly for next year, uh, we didn't necessarily think